my name is Richard Glasgow. I live in Alexandria. I work in Washington, D.C. as a transportation consultant in the area of intelligent transportation systems, as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Transportation. That's my job. Uh, the, the activity that uh, received the interest of the Living Legend program is my activity as the treasurer for ALIVE, Alexandrians involved ecumenically, and also being a uh, math mentor for the Higher Achievement Program. So the, those are some of the things that I do. I've lived in Alexandria for 29 years. Uh, is it? Wait a minute, 70, 85, 95, 05, 50, almost, almost 39 years. That's it. Um, I moved to Alexandria in January of 1975. I was in college at the time in New York, and my parents moved to Alexandria. My father became the Presbyterian minister of Heritage Presbyterian Church just south of town. And so I, I helped them move in. And then when I graduated from college, I decided the Washington area was a good place to look for a job in the area of math and computers. That was my specialty. And so I came to Alexandria and lived with my parents for a short while, and then I uh, got an apartment in the Delray area, and then, then a condo off Edsel Road, and, and I've lived for uh, 30 years in the Seminary Valley area of, of Alexandria. I grew up in Northeast Ohio. I was born in Cleveland, and my family moved to halfway between Cleveland and Akron, and then to Niles in the Northeast corner. And as I said, I moved to Alexandria when I was um, in early 20s, when I got out of college. So I'm partly Midwesterner and partly an Easterner here in Virginia. I've been here in Virginia much longer than in Ohio by now, but those are the only two major places I've lived. Alexandria is, is a special sort of place that I think is a neat place to live because of its historic uh, background, but it's a good balance between being a city and having the things that uh, a, a city has to offer, but it's not too big. It's, it's not all urban. It's got a, a, a balance of types of people and, and activities and has green space in it, and it has a community identity. That's, that's what I think is, is uh, one thing that makes Alexandria special. It, it, it has a town hall. It has a center of, of activity with the with George Washington Parade and the Scottish Walk and, and so forth that give it a, um, a, a community feeling that some of the other suburbs in the Washington area don't, don't seem to have. But then the other parts of the city have their identities as well. I live in, in the West End. And um, I feel that Alexandria is, is a nice size. All the students go to one public high school. There aren't a, a whole bunch of different high schools. So that, that's a unifying force. And um, the, the churches of Alexandria are uh, an important part of it. And that the, the churches have come together to make uh, alive that I'll be talking about later. It, it has a, a good community feeling. From the standpoint of ALIVE, Alexandrians involved ecumenically, it, it, it came about in order to serve the, uh, the under underprivileged people of Alexandria. And so in, in what is there about Alexandria that, that affects that? Well, the, the, the demographics of Alexandria are that there are, are, are well-off people and that there are people who are not so well-off. And we depend on, on, on those people for a lot of our services as well. And, and so ALIVE recognizes that people need daycare, need food or shelter, or need um, furniture when they're com coming out of prison, or need or coming out of a, an abuse situation. And so we want to be able to keep a wide variety of demographic, uh, demographics in the city of Alexandria, and ALIVE provides the services uh, to help support those people while drawing on the support of the whole community, especially, especially through the churches, but in, in other community organizations and corporations and foundations and individuals as, as well. I was inspired to become 
a member of Alive uh, through my church, Emmanuel Church on the Hill, is an Episcopal church in the, toward the, on Quaker Lane in, in Seminary Road. Uh, after I attended there for, for three or four years, I realized that several people I admired were active in this organization. One, per, one person in particular, Danny Bradford, who started the food distribution program as well as housewares distribution program. Those are two programs of Alive that deliver food and deliver housewares to people who need them in our neighborhood. Um, she nudged me over, over a period of a couple months or maybe a, a year to get involved in this organization uh, because it was such a, a, great, uh, a great thing to do. And eventually I, I yielded, I, I said, um, I, I can't do it right away, I've got something else, but after, after six months or a year, I said, okay, I'll, I'll become a representative from, from my church, Emmanuel Church on the Hill, to Alive, which is an organization primarily sponsored by churches and synagogues, and now the Baha'i faith in Alexandria. And what was appealing about it was that it do, didn't do just one thing. It didn't just distribute clothing. It didn't just distribute food. The... Um, the logo of Alive is a tree with many branches, and those many branches symbolize the many ministries of, of Alive. It does have a shelter for, um, for women and children. It does, does deliver food. It does operate a preschool for low-income working families. It provides money for rent assistance and medical assistance for prescriptions and, and rent and... Um, and then we deliver housewares to people who, are, who, who need beds <laughs> when, when they're literally starting from nothing. So those were inspirational programs to become involved with. And after a few years of being a representative from our church, I said, okay, twist my arm, and I'll be vice president, and then president the year after that. And I was, and those, those roles lasted for a year. But then after I retired as president of Alive, this was around 1990, it was, it was evident that what was really needed was a, a treasurer because our treasurer was leaving. So I like dealing with numbers. And uh, I said, okay, I'll do that. And that's what I've been doing ever since for like 23 years. And I think that's what, what awes people. Um, how, how have you been able to do this for, for 23 years? Well, it, it, the, the need continues to, ex to exist. And I... I um, feel a sense of satisfaction from being a part of a process that enables Alive to provide money for people who are about to be evicted from their apartments or to provide to pay a, a doctor's bill or to get medicine for them or somewhere. And I write the checks and send the checks to make that happen, and that is, is a good feeling. The challenges in being the treasurer for Alive are dealing with uh, all the, the, qu the questions that come up about writing checks to landlords or utility companies. And I send a check out, and then, it, then two weeks later, they say we never got it. And I need to figure out whether to void the check and write it, or did I get the address wrong or something. And, or, or, or people who write checks to Alive, the, the bounce. And you have to figure out what to do about that. So there, all the headaches of dealing, of keeping a checkbook, uh, a personal checkbook, uh, straight are multiplied many times when you're in, in an organization with a uh, budget of over a million dollars a year. And dealing with auditors and dealing with banks are, are a frustration. And if I were a, a paid treasurer for a corporation, then I would be paid for dealing with, with, uh, with frustrations like that. But I'm not. I'm a volunteer. So I have to say, I'm doing what I can, and I, if there's something that, that doesn't happen exactly right, well, that's a volunteer organization, and that's, that's the way it works. So it, it's not dealing with people that's the problem. It, it's um, the snafus, I think, when it comes to, to, um, to paying. Uh, the, the financial matters when they, they go crooked sometimes. Uh, I, I draw inspiration from the other officers of, of Alive, the, the family emergency chairman who takes the requests for financial help and screens them and passes them on to me, and the person who, who manages the food program and the person who manages the housewares program and the person who runs the, 
the homeless shelter. All of those are extremely dedicated, hardworking people too, and they, uh, some of them have been recognized as well. The, that's, that's an inspiration. Uh, on, on the higher achievement mentoring side, dealing with middle school students can be a frustration of a special category on, on its own when, when they're not keen on listening and just want to talk about other things or, or not talk at all. Um, my, my students are boys who just don't want to talk so, sometimes. So frustration of trying to get them to talk. I mean, we're not, we don't have to talk about math all the time. I, I talk about things in their lives, what, what do they like to do at, at other times. And um, it's, it's, uh, it takes some tricks to get them to, to open up and, and have a two-way exchange of the conversation. Another program that I've been involved with is the Higher Achievement Program of, of Alexandria and Washington. And that focuses on providing mentoring to middle school children, mostly underprivileged uh, children, from fifth to eighth grade. There are several wards in Washington, D.C. that participate in the program, and one in Alexandria. And my company, Noblis, um, wanted to, to um, find a community activity to become involved with and encourage the employees to, to become involved with. So uh, what inspired me to become a mentor for higher achievement was an email from uh, our company management that said, we suggest you um, check this out. And the school, Hammond School, where higher achievement meets, is less than a mile from my house. And I could pick the night. I had one free night a week, that, and I said, OK, I'll take Monday night. And I had the opportunity to mentor math to a group of uh, of middle school kids who turned, I, it turned out that I got three boys and I followed them through fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grades. And that's a different kind of good feeling that I get um, working through, uh, trying to inspire some students with the, uh, with the joy that I get of, of working with, with mathematical concepts. They, they're not quite the same place I am. They like football <laughs> and, and soccer. So they, they, they can't get excited about it the way that I do. But I, I get some of it through, and I believe that I have made a difference to uh, what, what they've done, done in school. And the whole higher achievement program has achieved miraculous results with um, building confidence for students and seeing that they do graduate from high school and go on to college. So it's, it's a terrific mentoring program. The math and science and literature are the, are the subjects that are um, that are offered, and the mentors um, choose one night per week and one of those three subjects and get a group that they can follow through. I, I haven't been a, a, a higher achievement mentor long enough for, to see people go on to do great things. I've, I've had the same group from fifth grade through eighth grade now. And um, yes, yeah, so it's certainly uh, a... Um, there's some satisfaction in, in seeing them grow up and become more mature in ways, the same as my own daughters. Uh, I, I have three daughters that grew up in the Alexandria Public Schools, and I have been involved in, um, in, in leadership and some activities in, at T.C. Williams in, in the band and in the drama programs that my girls were especially involved in. Um, I hope that the, my, my current math uh, students who are in middle school now will go on to do those kinds of activities in high school and I will certainly um, be interested in, in what they do. It, it, they'll probably be at T.C. Williams and I have a fondness for T.C. Williams uh, since my three girls all, all went there and a curiosity to see what kind of things uh, happen to it especially after they, they completely rebuilt the building into it a different configuration, and they're always experimenting with uh, um, ma different ways of managing the school and with assistant principals and sub schools and academies and so forth. They're curious about what, what that goes on. I, I got involved in, uh, in as an, a participant in organized politics for the um, 2008 presidential election, and at which point I um, made myself known to the, the Democratic organizers and, and said, what, what, what do you need people to do? And well, they need people to 
go around door to door um, distributing literature and, and, and encouraging people to vote. And so I did that for the 2008 and 2012 election. And I also did that for the most recent governor's election in, in Virginia. I have also worked on, um, on many occasions on signing people up for voter registration. We had a table at the uh, a shopping center or in front of the library or someplace like that where everybody that came by, I'd call out, are you registered to vote? If not, you know, come over and, and sign up. And that's a nonpartisan activity. Uh, but I do see a connection between my political activity and my charitable and religious activity. And that the reason that I became involved in, in the political process was because I felt that um, the responsibility for, um, for providing a decent level of living for all Americans is a political as well as a religious question. And so that the, the uh, electing officials who are mo mostly in tune with the environment and with women's issues and with economic issues, uh, justice for the poor and, and so forth, was something that I needed to do. It, it was a religious as, as well as a political duty. So I contributed my time for door-to-door -door canvassing, handing out material, encouraging people to vote. And for the candidates that I believe uh, had the most in tune with the, the social issues that I care about. The Living Legend project is pretty uh, amazing thing because it does provide um, publicity for people who are just doing their things. They, they're not doing it for the publicity. They're not doing it in order to get rec recognized or praised. Um, so they, people could be doing wonderful things for, for many years and no one else would know about it. So what the Living Legend program does is let other people know about it and, in, and provide encouragement to people who read about it to say, well, if he, if he can do this, maybe I could do something too. Um, it's, it's kind of an inspiration and um, it just provides an appreciation of the breadth of different things that people do to help out in Alexandria. I, it's not just one type of charitable activity that is recognized. I'm, I'm always very impressed when I look at the, at the list of nominees or the winners to say, gosh, I didn't even know that somebody was doing that. But by golly, I'm, now that I know that, I, I feel good that somebody has been doing that. And um, it, it might inspire me to, to make some connections or point someone else to work in that way. Say, I, I, I heard that this program is going on. Maybe you could fit in somewhere there. And so that as providing an, an inspiration to people to get involved or to just let them know what kind of things go on in our neighborhood uh, is a community building activity. Also from the historical standpoint, I think it's a great idea to make an intentional effort to uh, record people, to make, to make a record of what people do as a document of what our city is all about. It's the human side of it not just the, the police reports that we see in the, in the, in the newspaper, but it, it's, it's a good thing. The Living Legend program has grown over the last seven years, um, kind of gaining strength as people join the ranks of, of Living Legends. And its purpose is to not only recognize um, the people who have been doing creative and and um, helpful things for, for many years, but just to provide publicity about those programs uh, to the city and to help um, people throughout the city of Alexandria realize what a great place this is, how many things are going on that they might not have heard about before, and uh, perhaps inspire them to become involved in, in either one of those ways that have been recognized or, or a different way but to look at the city of Alexandria in a different way and, and recognize that there are environmental needs, that there are economic needs, that there are, are some people might, might go for uh, bike paths in the city or for, or for parks in the city or other people more directly in, in economic help, is to 
it inspires people to think about what is important to them about Alexandria and the fact that somebody cares enough about Alexandria to um, invest a lot of time in it is an inspiration to the rest of the city as well. I think two years ago, there was um, a woman from, from our church, Wendy John, who was named a living legend for organizing the, uh, the Emanuel Pumpkin Patch, which for, for many, many years has raised money for charity. And I thought, boy, she really deserves it. And she's terrific. And I net nowhere near being in that league. And Mike Oliver, the same way, he's the, the person, kind of my mentor and, and alive, when he became a living legend, I thought, boy, he really deserves it, and I'm, I'm nowhere in, in, that, in that group at all. So when I learned that I was nominated, and then when I was selected as a living legend, I, I thought, wow, is, is this, could this really be? Um, it made my mother proud any, anyway. That, that's, that's a big thing. My wife encouraged me to go go through with the application because it would make my mother proud, and it, and it did. And it made everybody in the, in the church and, and, and alive proud because it's not just me doing it on my own. I'm doing it as a part of one of these organizations. So it's bringing publicity and recognizing a whole group of people. So I feel that I'm not being recognized as an individual, but as somebody who is one piece of a program that is doing great things. I haven't started a new program on my own, but I have been uh, a diligent and um, faithful worker in carrying through some existing programs for quite a while. I certainly feel um, pleased to, to be recognized, but when people congratulate me for it, it's, oh, shucks, uh, thanks. <laughs> And not, it's not something to get a swelled head about. It's just keep working. I, in, in fact, I, I said at uh, a live meeting, if someone else would like to become a living legend by taking over my job, you're welcome. <laughs> Nobody took me up on it. <laughs> I've been a musician all my life. I, I started piano lessons in second grade. I started playing the clarinet in fourth grade in, in, uh, in school. and. Played clarinet and tenor sax through, uh, through high school and, and college. And at the same time, I've been in choirs ever since I was uh, in the cherub choir when I was probably five years old. So um, I, I grew up in church choirs. And um, so it was natural for me when I joined Emmanuel Church on the Hill to, to join the, the, the choir there. Uh, Emmanuel Church on the Hill is an Episcopal church, which is known for its, its liturgy and for its body of, of uh, religious music, uh, much of it English. And um, I have been happy to be part of that for, for th over 30 years. Some of it uh, contemporary, more, more of it is, is classical music. And, and um, the years from Renaissance music up through the 19th century probably most, most greatly represented. No, I, I do not do. Um, rock music in church. I'm, I, I could, but it, is, it isn't something that we do. All my three daughters have sung in the King Street Singers at, at T.C. Williams and have been in church choirs at one time or another. Uh, I think my oldest daughter is singing in her church choir in Chicago now. Uh, so, and, and my wife sings as well. She, she sings better than I do. And uh, so that, that's one activity that we do together. We, my wife and I do a lot of activities together. Uh, singing is one. We met Scottish country dancing in Alexandria. We do the Washington Revels at, at Christmas time together. Um, we like uh, camping and boating and outdoor hiking activities out, outside. So um, we do a lot of things together. And the, and we are fortunate that our three children have pretty much stayed within that, uh, within that fold of activity. They haven't rebelled and, and gone off and done other crazy things. Our, our three girls have grown up in Alexandria, starting with, with Polk Elementary, and then Hammond, and then 
uh, Howard and, and, and T.C. Williams. And, but they went off to college, and they have, uh, none of them is living in Alexandria at, at this time. One in Chicago, one in New York City, and one in Niagara Falls, Canada. So we don't know if they will come back to Alexandria. Uh, they might, but uh, we don't expect them to. So I, I think that our family, uh, we, we expect to stay in Alexandria, but it's a one generation thing, not, not my parents, <laughs> not my children. I became a Cub Scout in third grade and, and became a Boy Scout in fifth grade and stayed with the Boy Scout uh, program all the way through uh, probably 10th grade. And I was a, an achiever to the extent of going through the ranks of second class, first class, star life, and earning merit badges was, was a really fun act activity. Um, so e Eagle was the, was the goal, and I made that. And in fact, I got the bronze palm beyond that for getting more extra merit badges beyond that. Um, of course, Boy Scouts are known for their camping activities, and, and that fit in with my family's uh, love of camping all along. So that, that was um, an enjoyable part of, of scouting as far as I was concerned. After I left the Boy Scout troop, I, I was one of the founding members of an explorer post, which is the the older high school age group that had a special interest in boating. We, we got a sponsorship from uh, a store that sold uh, boats and outboard motors. So they, they supplied us with, with some boating equipment as well as loaning us some uh, snowmobiles in the winter. This was in Ohio, uh, so we got to use them. And uh, so the, there was a group of about 12 people in my Explorer post that really did a lot of canoeing and sailing together. Um, since I had three girls. I didn't have a direct exposure to Boy Scouts in Alexandria. Uh, my girls were Girl Scouts and started out with the Indian Princess program where we did some, some camping out there. And now I have a sailboat and we have two kayaks um, so my wife and I can go out together and, uh, on Poic Bay or on, on the Potomac Hun Hunting Creek or Lake Akatink or places around here we really enjoy paddling. So that is... Uh, my scouting activity has, has carried over to, to, we, we, uh, to do nautical activities. And when we do go on vacation, we still go camping sometimes. As far as Alive goes, there are many, many uh, opportunities for volunteering. So somebody who is interested in seeing what kind of things go on in Alexandria, ways to get involved. I would recommend participating in the food distribution program on the last Saturday of the month after food stamps have run out, people come and, and pick up food, or to participate in furniture moving, or to, um, or to read to children at the, at the homeless shelter. W within Alive, there are numerous um, opportunities for people to become involved on a, a one-time basis or a repeating uh, basis and have a chance to see for themselves what um, what sort of people are out there that, w that we serve and what the needs are. And they wouldn't have to stay with alive in, in, indefinitely to pursue those needs, but it would be an introduction to what sort of things uh, are being done in Alexandria to, to help our, our fellow residents. Uh, obviously, the, the, the um, Higher Achievement Mentoring Program is, uh, is an occasion for someone to volunteer on, on a regular basis to have a one-on-one a -on -one or a one-to-a-few relationship with some students and it really makes them um, uh, a meaningful relationship. Uh, my, my church, Emmanuel Church on the Hill, every year sells pumpkins and we're known as the Pumpkin Church. Everyone knows the, the field of orange pumpkins that are sitting out on, on Quaker Lane. And we can use all sorts of volunteers to help sell pumpkins or to help lift them off the truck and set them on the ground when, when the pumpkins arrive in, in the first uh, Sunday of October. It's not just our church. We have many community members who participated also. And the people who come to the pumpkin patch every year, uh, they, they come back every year because that they know that the money that they spend for pumpkin is going entirely to charitable uh, causes within Alexandria and outside of Alexandria. 
The church doesn't keep any of that. So that, that's a very fun way of helping something that is directly a, uh, a charity project. Just reading the newspaper of, uh, of things that go on, living legends or not, uh, is, is a way to find out what um, things are going on in Alexandria that would be good places to volunteer. I, I think people, whether it's, it's children or adults, shouldn't be put off thinking, I'm only one person, what could I do? Or I don't know what to do in order to make a difference. It, it starts with wanting to help, whether, whether you're a kid or, or, or an adult. And realizing that because of who you are and because you have some abilities, whatever they are, there is a way to, that those abilities can be used to help other people beyond just yourself. And it takes a little bit of effort, but not very much, to find out an organization in Alexandria that cares about the same things that you care about. And you don't have to make up a new program all, all by yourself. You can if, if, you're, if you have the motivation. But if you just have the desire to help, it's not difficult to find an organization to become involved with that can bring you in slowly and say, here, you can work, uh, hand out these cans of food to people that come up to the, to the front of the line. Um, and, and you get, begin to get an appreciation of of uh, the gratitude in people's faces and the gratitude in yourself when you realize that you are doing something that makes a difference. So it, it builds. It, it doesn't all come at once. But if, if you start to, um, to, to become involved, you will be inspired by other people. And then eventually, you may find that you are inspiring other people. Uh, that, that happened to me. I, I, I don't think that what I do is so terrific, but when I learn that someone else is inspired to do something because of seeing me, that makes me feel really good. I'd like to be remembered as, as a nice guy <laughs> Who's, uh, who, who worked to, um, who, who did some contribution to the church and to the community uh, and inspired others to, to do something like that as, as well. Um, I don't expect to be remembered as somebody who started a new program or had a great vision, but I have devoted myself to a few projects for over, over a long time where I like to think that I have made a positive difference as well as um, through ra raising my three daughters in Alexandria, and one, one is, a, is a teacher, and one is working in historical preservation, and the, the third is in the process of figuring out what her career is going to be. But that's, that's my contribution to uh, humanity and to our society, is to um, raise people in my own family or, or those that I help to become happy and functioning citizens of the community.